on this panel, we have um, three great voices and perspectives. Um, Poonam can speak specifically to the film that you've seen and the perspective um, that she brings, having worked with MacArthur and sort of seen the foundation side and now with um, Population Foundation. And then Raj will give us a perspective, having run an NGO and continues to run an NGO in the education space, uh, as that has potential to improve child marriage. And then, of course, Dina we have, um, who is managing a large and a significant contribution to ending child marriage through their partnership with American Jewish World Service. And so why don't we just jump right in? Poonam, tell us. So what you just saw is a um, multimedia 360 degree approach to change behavior, not just for ending child marriage, but for greater value for girls, respecting, empowering, educating girls. And why did we do this? We did this because we found that behavior change communication globally had not worked in many of the cases. And there's global evidence to show that entertainment education does work. And Seoul City is a great example in South, Af South Africa and many other countries. But what we really want to do when you're talking about or working on child marriage is you can't just work with the adolescent girl and have her get up and stop the marriage. You have to work with gatekeepers. You have to work with uh, religious leaders, elders. You have to do societal change. You know, the paradox when we are working on issues of girl, child, and child marriage especially is that what we think is a solution, is a, a problem, is a solution by the family. The community, society thinks marrying girl early saves them from uh, uh, social, uh, 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 sexual abuse and many other risks. So we have to really understand that this is a very complex issue where we have to work at multiple levels. And so we chose radio, we chose t television where you can meet, uh, reach large numbers of audience in India. We're showing this on Doordarshan, which, whose reach Reach is 80%. The poorest media dark places do not, cannot afford um, television. Uh, what is the TV called? Where you pay and subscribe. This is the government free television. And uh, we also are on radio, and now we're doing messaging through using telephones for young people as well as religious leaders and others. And we, I must mention um, one small example. Uh, we have this IVRS, which is the Interactive Voice Response System, where we've received 500,000 phone calls. And one day after Meeti tells her father, yes, I will study and become a prime minister, we got a call from a 14-year-old girl from Bihar, whose name was Pragya, and she's in class 8, and she says, I am very convinced after seeing this serial that I can do anything. I can even become the prime minister of this country. And then she repeats, yes, I'm only eighth class and 14 years. And when I looked at the date when she had said that, I realized that it was one day after the serial. We've had fathers call in and say, we thought we'll never educate our daughter. One father calls and says, ask my wife. I've registered my two daughters in school now after seeing the serial. So the impact is broad, issues complex, and we have to work at multiple levels. Yeah, and what do you, what do you think, Raj, with uh, the complexity of child marriage? There's, there's often a whole discourse around if we're building all these aspirations and they don't actually go anywhere, is there a, a point sort of to all of this? And I know that you're working in the schools and potentially building aspirations, but, but what do you think about this piece and attacking child so, marriage? Uh, I think yeah, Poonam, uh, Poonam said it very right that uh, it's a much more complex issue and ma many times we end up simplifying it by just blaming the parents or blaming them that how come they don't understand this such a simple uh, fact about it. Now education is also spoken as you know one of the ways in which that can be avoided. But then what happens is that if the education is not relevant, then what? You now, for example, the secondary schools. So in India, the, uh, the statistics is that for every five secondary or primary schools, you have one secondary school. So the mostly the girls from the rural areas suffer a lot because of that, because they'll go to primary school, but then the nearest secondary school is almost seven to eight kilometers away. And in the process, they have to drop out. So it's not that everybody wants to get the girl out of the school. 
so and, and even another way another complexity comes and and that is a real life itself in a indian uh, condition is the, if the girl is too much educated they can't find a boy for that girl you know and and this is a real life you know uh, this thing they, and and so many educated parents also knowingly will make that decision not to you know have a girl who is go for masters education or something like that right so it is a complex situation but the uh, so uh, the organization that i run and i'm co-founder of uh, lender hand india we are working in the secondary schools making the secondary school education relevant so that the parents will think that that opportunity cost of not having that girl at home who could have done you know the housework or who could have done work in the field uh, to contribute to the productive as a productive member of the family uh, also turns out to that yes it is better to keep the girl in the school as well right and the program which we are running in which uh, the girl and the boys it's not just a girl focused program we we work with uh, the entire school and introduce sort of a vocational training as part of the school curriculum but then what we are doing is that the uh, curriculum is gender neutral so it is not that uh, girls are learning just beauty parlor or girls are learning cooking or girls are learning embroidery and uh, boys are learning welding carpentry plumbing uh, but everybody learns everything and what we have seen actually in in uh, in uh, in the real life uh, setting that if there is a set of four girls doing the engineering job of welding welding something and there is a set of four boys are uh, doing the same job the girls have always done it better and faster you know uh, <laughs> so i think a lot of times you know we have to break down our own traditional mindset right what girls are uh, capable of uh, uh, doing in those you know uh, cases and believe me by the way boys also love cooking you know and and the stri- uh, stitching and embroidery uh, uh, as well so i think doing something like that which will make parents feel that yes having the girl in the school is contributing very productive way because the same girl is now on her way back i mean there was a incident where she was carrying her she was carrying her sc- we we ad- do allow them to carry tools back home if they want to by you know registering somebody saw in the village uh, a girl carrying a big you know screwdriver with her so she was like what are you doing you know you'll never imagine a girl with a screwdriver going home and she said no i learned this in the school so now she got called to repair a battery which was not working in that home you know so i think things like those looking at it from a positive standpoint rather than you know blaming uh, will more and more work and it's a long term i mean it's it's for the long haul you know we are at this whatever statistics uh, that is after hundreds of years you know so it will take a long journey uh, to get there so what what is needed is sort of having a long term view uh, to get there and uh, sort of be patient about it. Yeah, and Dina, can you give us your perspective? Let's let's just take take a a step back because I think what we've seen from from Dasra and when we did the report, marry me later, was that this is a fairly it's an old issue, but it's a new issue that's come onto the global agenda, and that when we tried to find organizations on the ground, there aren't a whole lot that have a very clear outcome. That's child marriage, like let's delay the age and the pregnancy. And so, how have you? figured this out you were clearly before you know if we want to call it hype now and why have you really placed it at child marriage and not education health and sort of this whole comprehensive perspective thank you um and first i just want to say thank it's just an honor to be up here this is i think the first time the candida fund has had the chance to speak about this endeavor we've taken on and and i have some mentors like Maya Jmer and others in the room and experts Vanita Ford so you know and all of you who I haven't met yet we really view this as an opportunity to to talk and get feedback um and and learn from you all and the expertise we have here um so about 2 years ago I had an incredible opportunity to um begin to do some work with a private philanthropy uh based here in America called the Candida Fund Um and there was interest in doing work with girls and women around the world and I have some background in this and I was you know doing more reading and learning and and this issue of child marriage sort of popped up in intersections in between things I would read and I thought how you know sort of how have I not heard of this how you know how come this hasn't been you know growing up for me it was FGM and cutting and girls in school um sexual violence rape fistulas so many things and and yet this issue hadn't really crossed um 
crossed my path. Um, and and so we we made a decision to do this work in South Asia, but relatively quickly. Uh, I sort of learned a couple things um, that that there is some utility. I still believe in calling out the issue of early in child marriage, and I'll talk about we're sort of shifting in our own description of using um, using the term early marriage versus child marriage. There's still utility in that because it is an issue that a lot of times is not spoken of, and there's real power in in naming that. And at the same time, if that is sort of the sole focus of our work. Um, we lose a lot of opportunities for impact, and there's, I think, a few reasons why. Um, the first is for us, but also even more so for communities, it's kind of hard to lead or get excited or be catalytic or transformational around something you don't want. And so for us, pretty quickly as we started doing work in India, we were asked some tough questions about it's clear what you don't want or what you think is bad, but what are you for? What are the communities, and more importantly, what are the communities in which we're working, what are they for? What are the girls for? What are their families for? Um, and so it's been as important for us to define what we are for as much as it is what we're against. Um, the second, and, and um, uh, Poonam and Raj both alluded to this beautifully, is my own experience has been that there are good people all over India and all over the world um, who are trapped in a paradigm um, and incredible fathers, um, incredible mothers, incredible community leaders, um, amazing girls. Um, and I, I had an opportunity um, in April to meet with a really amazing feminist leader in Ajmer and, and she said to me, and this is a woman who, you know, is just just this amazing feminist. And she said to me that, having her daughter every day feels like having a mountain on her chest. And you realize that men and women around the country are sort of put in a paradigm into sort of view, and there's an enemy, and there's a good guy, and the good guys are the girls, and the enemy's parents is, is completely not useful. Um, and I think the third thing, which I've really come to understand, is that with child marriage in particular, it's possible to reach the goal without really reaching the goal. Um, and with all due respect to the session before me, but maybe to be a little bit controversial, um, the metrics piece on this one is really hard. I hope we'll talk about ROI and things like that because it is you know, entirely possible, and we've seen examples of delaying marriage from 15 to 18, so it's no longer child marriage. Isn't that wonderful? But if nothing about that girl's lived reality has changed, if she still doesn't have choice about who she marries, when she has her children, um, whether she has sex or not on any given evening, uh, does she have a livelihood outside the home and opportunities for livelihood? Can she stay in school? Really, there's not much of a difference between getting married at 15 or 18. And so we've sort of continued to believe that this entree of this issue is particularly useful for sparking conversation. And it forces you to get into all of the other tough issues. And at the same time, um, you know, we use that as an opportunity to hopefully broaden the conversation. No, I absolutely agree with what uh, Dina's saying. And I have, in fact, huge discomfort when uh, people try and de-link the issue of uh, um, uh, ending child marriage or postponing marriage with all the other issues of education, women's empowerment. And as I said earlier, from the floor, the MDGs, the MDGs you will not be able to achieve unless you invest in all these issues, education, empowerment, and actually it's about caring. It's it, Child marriage is one of the worst manifestations of discrimination and lack of safety uh, that women and girls especially experience. And unless you focus on um, 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 the, the social dimensions, not just maternal mortality, child mortality, and all these issues. And you have to, you know, why should we value a girl child in a developing country any less than anywhere in the world? It should not just be equal, it should be absolutely more. And ultimately, it is not about postponing age at marriage as it happened in Nigeria and many interventions in India by one year. A girl is still not ready to be a spouse at age 18. A girl is still not ready for getting, uh, um, uh, having a child. We know that maternal mortality is twice as higher. We know that child mortality is twice as higher. And a woman, uh, a young girl, 
cannot negotiate protected sex, uh, has a higher incidence of HIV AIDS. We know that for many parts of the world. And finally, a child having a child, she's neither emotionally nor physically ready. So, um, and, and as far as not keeping girls in school isn't good for the economy, why doesn't the industrialists and the policy makers understand that? There is a World Bank report today which gives evidence that India loses $7 billion because we don't educate our girls and they don't become protective, uh, productive assets. So if there is a child marriage, you're basically ending not just the life of the girl to live in an unsafe situation, but it's also uh, you're opening all possible opportunities for her to care for her children, care for her um, um, uh, family. Yeah. So, so Raj, you, you, I know you wouldn't disagree with what Poonam's saying. I'm not. I, I, yeah. <laughs> Even though, yeah. I'm with three women here. I cannot. <laughs> and and you know, none of us would would disagree with the the emphasis and on all that we need to do. But I know that you're always the practical voice of what's happening on the ground. So you know, we want to do all these things. It's extremely challenging. There isn't a whole lot of funding pegged at child marriage. It's you know either sexual reproductive health or it's education. So give us your perspective. What's what's going on on the ground? What's the challenges with philanthropy as you see it, you know, in the child marriage spectrum? So I think there are there are long held beliefs, right, which are there, right, in the policy makers, in the decision makers, as well as in the principal and other people uh, uh, too, uh, which one needs to address uh, in order to you know get out of it. Like even now, when we are getting funding for our program. Uh, to you know, uh, do this vocational training, uh, they the donor will say, "Why are you teaching this carpentry and plumbing to girls?" You know? And and this is coming from somebody who is very educated and you know very urban centric, and you will think that uh, it must be having the most open mind, right? And same with the policy makers uh, as well. We were selecting. I, I was working with the state government, and we were looking at the trades in which the vocational training will be introduced in grade 9th and 10th uh, they were always like oh we'll teach beauty parlor to girls and you know uh, this auto mechanic uh, training to boys and they moved away from embroidery uh, tailoring i know <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know so uh, so i think the challenging part is that you know these parents and all uh, they are the least of the you know because at the end of the day if i change one parent there is going to be one girl will you know, whose life will change. Working on these policy people, working on these decision makers, you know, or the principals, or principal of the school and other things too, is also like much more important because they are the one who are deciding what goes down uh, at the end of the day as, you know, part of this uh, uh, solution, right, uh, that way. And secondly, uh, even, even when a girl is trying to do something, you know, uh, the, the network of support which is not there, and especially in the rural settings, because in the urban, uh, you have many outlets, you have many exposure, many role models, or you can go to you know people. But but in the rural setting, it becomes all the more uh, difficult because there actually you are being pulled pulled out of you know why are you doing this you know or what what is the point of doing this and other things too. So focusing on that, and the third thing is that most of the time the education related and other interventions which are there are mostly focused on the primary. You know, uh, education or oh, the secondary is still, you know, and, and rightly, you know, first you need to get the primary education right, then the secondary can come and other things too. But I'm not sure whether we have time to uh, time to wait, right, like that in a sequential uh, uh, manner. And uh, and I'm glad that more and more focus is going towards secondary school education too, because that's where you know a lot of it can be brought. Even at part of uh, our now that we are working with the schools for. Uh, five to six years uh, now, we have started introducing. Uh, uh, we just started introducing our, around the nutrition part, you know, uh, at the uh, metal and nutrition and other other things too. Right from the age eight, uh, working with those girls, uh, so that will. Ha of course, it is hard and to change the mindset of the management as well as the education. But then, you know, standing up against them and making them believe, you know, what needs to be done is what what is needed. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know. Ten years ago, child marriage was not heard of anywhere, even five, seven years ago. The world really very sadly woke up to child marriage 
when the issue of MDGs, maternal mortality, we have to reduce, child mortality, and we realize, the world realizes that it's stubborn because you're marrying girls early, they're having babies early, and uh, have double the incidence of um, risk of child, uh, maternal mortality and child mortality. So the world very sadly came. It didn't come for a, to care about the girl child. Um, I um, had a call when this particular episode, we had 52 episodes, and this is one of the episodes. I had a call, I hope none of you are from McKinsey, but it's not a reflection on McKinsey. I had a call from somebody in McKinsey in India who leads the health program. He called me and said, what is your serial showing? We don't have this kind of child marriage and discrimination against girls in India. So the world is so blind. And this is someone who works on health issues. So um, I think it's very important to take it out there and relate it to all the issues that we care about. I'd like to turn the MDGs upside down and show how they're all related to keeping girls in school. And I am so glad that the Sustainable Development Goals have child marriage in it. And it hadn't been for organizations like Dasra seriously. And Candida Foundation recognized it. Judith is sitting back there. Her work on maternal mortality, our work on maternal mortality in, uh, sadly, for us too, we came to, Judith, we came to uh, look at the issue of child marriage through maternal mortality lens. So I think we have to make up for our sins of neglecting all these girls who've been in, who've been uh, 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 violated uh, sexually in many different ways. And why do I say sexually? We, we supported a study which showed on child marriage that sexual and domestic abuse and domestic violence was highest amongst child brides. So I think the world needs to do something quickly and extensively. And I think one of the challenges that um, that I'm sort of grappling with now in our work is how to take advantage of this sort of worldwide attention that this issue is garnering and yet handling um, in our work this issue through a lens that is really about, in this case, India. Um, we work in a couple other countries, but largely in India. Um, and there's a couple of things that I sort of learned relatively quickly that, um, you know, just made me realize again the importance of um, developing a nuanced understanding of the problem in a particular context. So the, f the first is that um, the shape of the problem obviously looks very different um, around the world. Uh, the age disparities that we see in many countries in the, um, in the Middle East we see it somewhat in India, but not nearly to the same extent. In India, obviously, what is much more common is, you know, a, a age disparity between a groom and a bride that may be, you know, three, four, five years. And yes, there are examples of 20 years, 30 year age disparities, but that changes the dynamic of, of that relationship in and of itself. Um, uh, relatedly, I think um, we wanted to understand why. I mean, I, I spent a couple of weeks, two Aprils ago, um, in India and meeting with a lot of feminist leaders and got a lot of blank stares um, when we started talking about this issue. And I really couldn't understand why, but knew that that was sort of the only reason I was there was to seek to understand. And what, what became apparent and what I've learned um, through the partnership with AGWS and the work they did um, or are doing with a feminist group called Narantar is that in essence, the issue in India has, um, I think in, in many cases, been sort of captured by, um, and, and not in a bad way, but captured by a child, the child protection um, uh, groups. And that's fine, great. I mean, it, it's not really fine, but it is what it is. They've got a history there and they're, they're approaching it from the perspective of um, how do we protect children who are being subjected to this horrible practice. And when you look at the reality of a 15 or 16 year old girl, um, she's, it's not the same as an eight year old girl being married to a, you know, a 50 year old man. And she's dealing with 
her own sexuality. She's dealing with falling in love maybe for the first time with someone who she's not supposed to be in love with. And so for us, um, you know, we knew we needed to be thinking about the issue much through the much more through the lens of empowerment um, and less through the lens of a protectionist strategy. And so one of the things we're trying to do to make this work India specific, um, and it's really, you know, I think through the brilliance of our partner in AJWS, is to try to bring in um, the the unfunded, unaffiliated movements, um, which have this incredible, rich history and tradition in India. Um, the women's movement, the labor movement, the youth movement, all who haven't touched these issues because they've been sort of owned by the child protection um, crowd. And so how do we begin to reframe this issue um, as one to be about empowerment, and how can we catalyze uh, the efforts of those movements, um, which will go on much longer than any programmatic grant that we are able to make. Um, and so for us, it's been interesting to sort of make uh, Indian-specific grants while at the same time try to ride on the backs of this global phenomenon um, of, of interest and excitement about the issue of child marriage. Um, when in many of the cases, the way it's portrayed around the world is, I think, very different from the quality of how it looks in India. Yeah, Raj, can you speak? To, do you agree with this? It's important with which lens we look at this. Why, why does it actually matter? You know, Jeff Walker talked about let's just get to a measurable outcome and let's not worry about the, the lens per se. Maybe that's not what he's saying. Is Jeff here? OK, good. <laughs> no, no, he's not. <laughs> No, actually, you know... Now I know what's going to happen when I leave the room, so. <laughs> But you didn't say what Jeff said. No, see, I am a Guju, right? So I really Gujarati. don't care what is, what is it called or what lens it is wearing. At the end of the day, if it achieves the objective that we all want to, you know, that is what matters the most, right? Uh, and so whether it is, you know, child, bachpan, bachao, yeah, you know, whatever, or whether it is livelihood or whether it is a vocational training or whether it is education or because the problem is so huge that none of them can capture issue themselves, right? I mean, or the number of girls or, you know, I mean, many times when people say that, are you afraid of this competition in India? We say India is so huge that there's not going to be one organization which can do anything about any, you know, everything. So maybe they can just divide the buckets, you know, <laughs> like you, you take this and I'll take this or whatever. But I don't think that it matters, you know, under what lens it is being looked at. As long as the people that we are talking about, the girls, are benefiting one way or another and leads to, you know, outcome that we are looking for. Yeah, but P Poonam, why don't you also speak to this, right? Why why don't we think about it where Raj does the education piece, let's bring somebody else that does a health piece, let's bring somebody else that does an employability piece, and provide this comprehensive programming that everybody dreams about here in the city during the UNGA. I mean, it doesn't happen practically, but what do you think? I. You know, while we can all do what we have expertise in, it has to be linked. It has to sum up. Like we said, you can't just um, educate a girl and then put her in, even if you educate her and if she has no choice, mobility. Um, she doesn't have any mobility. Even if she marries at age 19 or 20, she's going to experience the same kind of abuse, violence, lack of autonomy, and not be able to contribute to her economic Mm, opportunity. So I think when you're working with girls, even even the reviews, you know, we've done a systematic review of 27 interventions in Bangladesh, Nepal, Africa. So I'm talking about not just India here. And we found that wo no one, these are evaluated with gold standards, no one intervention was able to solve the problem. So we have global evidence. Those who are not reading the evidence, please read instead of silos that lets one is not connected to other. And even the world that set up MDGs doesn't realize that it's also interconnected. You cannot work on, in silos. For instance, if you have, if you have um, a young girl who's um, mobility is totally restricted um, she's she's not able to go for family planning services to a family 
uh, care center, we have a very large database in India called National Family Health Survey, which is done by the government of India, uh, interviewing 125,000 ever married women. These are not even unmarried women, but these are not unmarried women, but starting with age 15, because girls marry at age 15, so it's legitimate to in, uh, interview girls who are 15, showed that 60% of the girls had experienced, women and girls had experienced violence preceding, six months preceding the survey. And of them, 40% felt it was legitimate to be beaten by the husband if they stepped out of the house without permission of the husband, which included primary health care center and buying vegetables. So if girls don't have autonomy, and while the feminists, Raj, I disagree with you, name is fine, but it's the approach. What is in a name, it doesn't matter. But the approach of protecting the girl child is what is sending her into child marriage. So I'm really against this protection approach, child protection officers who tell me, why are you breaking marriages? When we do training of child protection officers, they're saying you're not allowing a home to get settled, you know, a family to get settled, a girl to go into her marriage and as though everything will be happy thereafter. I think we have to step out of that comfort zone and say to the parents that your daughter is not safe if you're going to get her married at 15 or 16. She's not under her, uh, safe in any, any, any way. So what the feminists are saying, I think we have to listen to them. Just uh, uh, And they may not work at the grassroots <coughs> level, but they do represent and share with you the realities of women that they have experienced. You are doing, you're in the trenches, but let's interact together and work together. So, <laughs> so <laughs> no, no, of course I'm always for working together. <laughs> <laughs> and with feminist He's and with child production. No. <laughs> no, you know, I, I wanted to ask this question for the panel before, right? Uh, I think, you know, this collaboration, partnership, synergy. I'm talking about intellectual <laughs> collaboration too. <laughs> uh, those are very nice words. You know, mm. But to, you know, make it happen on the ground, it are the most difficult. That's what that's is for. And <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Uh, you know, because, see, I mean, and, and the, my theory behind it is that, like earlier, earlier in the morning, somebody was saying that the social enterprise, or entrepreneurs are crazy, right, when they start this. They're passionate about their idea, what they want to do. They are, you know, very sort of firm on my way or highway, you know. And that's why they are there. Otherwise, they would have made their millions working in the private sector in the first place. So that itself doesn't lend to a conducive environment for partnership, right? Because partnership always comes with give and take. You know, it doesn't, because when I partner with somebody, that means it's not just partnership, just taking funds and I'll do my way. It is to compromise or sort of adjust the way I do, it is to listen to others and other things too. And let's be frank here, you know, we people in the nonprofit industry are very sort of, you know, uh, that way, very focused on what we do and that is how we do it, right? So that is one part of it. Secondly, as soon as, and, and we are experiencing that at Lend Hand right now, that because we have been working with the schools for the last five, six years, we said, okay, how can we deepen our relationship with the school by doing more, you know, things around it. So we are doing nutrition, we are doing science and math teacher training, because at the end of the day, just providing job and life skills training to secondary students is not going to do everything like we were just mentioning here. But, but then, now the donors are coming back and telling us that you are not focused. It's like you need to pick an area, work on it, because you have so much of bandwidth. And as soon as you start getting into these other areas, uh, then you know you are compromising on the mission that you start with, right? So, so I, so actually at Lend a Hand, frankly, we are very, very cautious about entering into any partnership at all, you know, because uh, because at the end of the day, it has to work, and if it doesn't work, then you have lost so much of time, lost so much of resources. And then, you know, uh, sort of the whole thing sort of doesn't go according to what you, you know, 
looking for right raj and your donors uh, cannot dictate our intellectual pa uh, partnership <laughs> and our values va values come come coming on common values platform let the donors dictate don't let the donors dictate to you but if they do in terms of the work you do it's we are talking about a lens how do you look at child marriage no, do you uh, look at it from a protection lens uh, or do you look at it from an empowerment uh, uh, lens and let's educate the donors if they're not educated. No, so, you know the challenge is I think Raj, and what you're. And will work with us on that. But you know we can't if you're not, if it's challenging to be collaborative at a ground level, right? I, I I agree with you, and I think that's what he's going to to say more of is that it's a challenge to when you're doing your work to try and collaborate, and and it goes back to earlier like what are the incentives for for you to have to collaborate as you're trying to do more comprehensive programming? And Dina, what what's your perspective? right you're you're pumping in a whole lot of cash into this and are you creating any incentives is there a collaboration partnership piece and then right after this we're going to open it up for questions yeah um so we have uh, maybe sort of at a level above the ground we're i mean i am the staff person on this um and so one of the things we learned relatively quickly was um, our frame of reference is the best work. The only sustainable work is happening in communities, led by communities, um, investing in community leaders. I knew that wasn't going to be me, uh, the person who was going to find uh, these incredible community leaders um, and did not have the connections with the social movement. So we've you know, partnered relatively significantly in the countries with we're working with um, you know, one or more key partners in India, that's American Jewish World Service. In Bangladesh and Nepal, we're working um, closely with CARE. Um, so at that level, um, I, I actually um, have taken, I mean, you all let me know if it's different, but I think I've taken a relatively hands-off approach to forcing collaboration. I've sort of, you know, made a made an introduction or two, but um, from my perspective, and, and people have told me this, like when the funder is trying to sort of bring all their grantees together, it's always like that's they're your grant. That's your lens, right? Like they're all your grantees. That's your lens. To to you, it's important that they are all meeting. But to them, they they may have other connections, maybe more relevant for them. Um, and so, you know, the work that we've tried to do is to give enough money to our partners to be able to come together with whomever they want to build their capacity with whomever they feel like are the best people to build their capacity, but not necessarily to to dictate. Um, to dictate any any particular partnership. No, I, I don't think it's particularly valuable. Okay, great. I'm going to open it up to questions. And, and then I'll come to forced marriage, marriage when donors dictate. Forced marriage that donors dictate. Yeah. Any questions? Yes, Dr. Fernandez. Right here, Vikas. And then I'll come to you. I'm just adding another dimension to child marriage. We talk about you know, empowering uh, girls and women and families and communities and uh, educating them. And But um, if you look at what happens in the country, why do child marriages take place? They take place because deeply rooted in tradition. So, you know, if tradition is taken, built over centuries to change that, it's not going to be easy. But we have some tool that we are not making use of. And if you see the government of India, many of the things we talk about, they have policies and laws against it. Yeah. And we have a law against child marriage. Yeah. And somehow we need to get the government to enforce this. You know, one, on one side you sort of empower women and communities, but the other side, unless you show them the whip and there should be a disincentive to child marriage. I think the two should meet if you want to be successful in preventing child marriages. Such a good, con I mean, this has been one of the things I've grappled with the most is there are laws in many, many countries around the world and yet the practice persists and how do we um, engage governments? What does it even mean actually to enforce the law? Does it mean we're gonna go around arresting parents and you know what does that mean for communities? And so for me, we, we actually have a grant to, um, to, one of our grants is to Human Rights Watch in part to sort of help us explore what does meaningful, um, appropriate 
enforcement look like um, in a world in which 47% of the girls are, you know, sort of experiencing this and in which um, prosecuting parents is not really a sustainable, I don't think, solution. And the, and the communities have to lead that change. The communities have to be the ones maybe collectively demanding, um, you know, a government response. It's tricky. I mean, I, I they're rolling back laws, you know, in, in Bangladesh as we speak. They're, you know, looking at passing, and and so the legal mechanism is critical, but um, can't can't be the only thing we rely upon, obviously. Martha, we're going to keep going, Dr. Fernandez. Yes, Martha. Sorry, Martha, Martha, Martha Brady, the Population Council. Thank you all very much. It's an excellent panel. Just a couple things that strike me. One is, I think that. Early in child marriage is unfortunately not new. It's been going on for a long time in many places in all over West Africa, et cetera. And one of the things that we've learned over the years in Ethiopia and Upper Egypt and other places in which we've worked, that one needs to actually look at the gate, girls' gatekeepers because those are actually the girls don't volunteer to get married. They're being pushed into marriages. And so we need to work with who are those gatekeepers and how do you actually, it's about really a greater valuing of girls is most marriages are economic economic transfers if you like from households and I think we have to really understand that and appreciate what the girls gatekeepers are up against and so one of the things that we've done for example in Ethiopia to actually delay marriage by two years okay so that may not be a huge amount but if you look at health outcomes that's actually a very large amount was to actually find the economic ties that families basically didn't want to marry their girls off necessarily at a young age because most people know that's not a great thing, but they felt that the girls were economic burdens to a household when in fact they're actually the income generation in many cases. But so we actually figured out ways to find the economic levers that would help families not marry off their daughter, but rather keep them in school and keep them non and keep and, and we had a contract that you would not marry off your daughter for X number of years. So in any case, I think the point of sort of understanding where these gatekeepers are and how they how they we can influence them, I think, will be key to this. One key. Uh, great, thanks. Can we move to questions, please? Yeah, Chaitlin, do you have a question? Okay. Actually, I have a question. I mean, in the previous panel, somebody said that there is a money in India. And uh, I, do, I do think, yes, there is. Now, my question to the panel is that apart from the, even in the nonprofit sector, on the corporate side, apart from the philanthropy, I give an example coming from the banking side that I used to see a banking product which would say for girls, save in girls' account for their marriage, which would say for boys, save for their education. So then we tried that why can't that subject should be changed for the girls also that save for education. And we approached banks. And I just want to share that yes, many banks came with that product. So my question to the panel is that there are some big players in India, they have resources. How much are we have been able to really impact their thinking because then they can play a big role. and. Uh, so and, and they are not that rigid. They are ready to change because they are just looking in the market and the potential. So have we been able to address? Yeah, Raj, those do you want to speak to you know your interactions with corporates and and how you see them as a player potentially in this space of it all? Is it changing? So it is changing, but but you know, but at the end of the day, they are in the business of making money, no? and uh, so if. You know, if the Indian parents' mindset is such that I need to save for my girl's marriage, and, and in, I need to, you know, save for my boy's education, and that is what is going to sign up that parent, you know, for the bank account or whatever that product is uh, going to go. Obviously, the marketing is going to be of that, you know, you know, sort. So, but what at the same time? So it's a huge because even the person who is deciding this marketing campaign. His ROI is not related to whether, you know, a, ch a girl's age, a marriageable age, age went up by one year or two years. His ROI, his ROI, ROI is more around how many bank accounts you sold, right? So, the, uh, I think there's a lot of, you know, uh, this kind of sort of marketing campaign and all that where it is uh, put the money uh, into. 
lot of education of those decision makers is involved in that uh, case right but then unless you change the metrics we have been talking about metrics of that marketing campaign which can include a social cause as well that change is not going to happen in that sense yes yeah, cinnamon Oh, thank you. Uh, Sidaman Dornstai from with Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. This is a question for a uh, question for Poonam. And in the video, um, I was struck about the mentors and the decision makers. And there was one key male positive decision maker, the father who would protect the child. I'm wondering, you know, in addition to persecution, a uh, uh, rather prosecution. Um, <laughs> Freudian slip, right? Yeah, prosecution um, and uh, upholding existing laws. How about in videos using some kind of carrot approaches? So to show key decision makers, ministers or others, um, and village leaders, men, upholding the rights of girl children and daughters. So uh, in the serial, the older father is this serial is called I, a Woman Can Do Anything, and this older man, Patriarch, who uh, is a school teacher, has three daughters, and he's taught them. There's a beautiful song which I couldn't show you, I, a Woman Can Do Anything and Achieve Anything, and he's the one who's taught that song to his three daughters. So he's a great mentor to his daughter. So what we're showing is a role model of this man because we found, you know, the serial is based on positive Devin studies. So Meaty's story is a real life story. And we found in the 182 positive Devin studies we did, it was always unfortunately or fortunately the male who, it wasn't the mother who had the say. It was the, if only the father could be convinced not to marry or the school teacher, then it was both men and women, but women at home don't have the say. So we ha do have a lot of role models. In fact, in the including the doctor who took her out and uh, the doctor's a role model. Um, second, I want to say in the cultural construct where men behave very differently towards girls. We are trying to change in the serial. For instance, we have uh, those of you who are going to see the 52 episodes, we have a young man, Puran, who starts as an alcoholic, young, irresponsible husband who doesn't practice family planning, doesn't retain a job, doesn't do anything. We reform him at the end of the serial. And the interesting thing is, <laughs> into a good man who can retain a job, happy family, uh, practices family planning, cares for his daughters and so on. And you know, when we did the pilot testing, every woman who saw it in the rural or urban area said, there's a Puran in my family. She didn't say my son is like Puran. <laughs> every boy said, I have a, my friend is like Puran. He didn't say I am like Puran. So we are doing that. In fact, in the next season two of Me Kuch Bhi Kar Sakti Hoon, we have an, a community where the school teacher, the political leader, everybody's playing a very positive role to empower adolescents and change what we said earlier, social norms, especially in the cultural construct. You know, I mean, let me describe a young girl in two sentences. She, uh, it's an essay that my daughter wrote when she was very young. She wrote um, in, in, or oh, she quoted, in India, a girl is at best a unwanted, uh, no, a temporary guest in her parental house and an unwanted visitor in her um, in-law's house. And you know, when you're talking about that culture, which, which discriminates at both ends against girls, is really not valuing the girl child. So at the end of the day, whether it's sex selection, age at marriage is related to the uh, uh, early marriage. Marriage is stubbornly not going up, partly because you have this huge shortage of girls. Mm, because of sex adverse sex ratios and girls young girls are marrying early to older men or are being bought trafficking is increased by the way i consider uh, child marriage um, a form of slavery and child slavery and there is real child slavery too in terms of today buying the girl child so we really have to work we have to get our values right as donors and start really investing in valuing, you know, supporting work that values girls uh, in many different ways. 
Boris, last question all the way here. Sure. Well, just taking a playbook from what's happening in the U.S. with domestic violence and sports, so the NFL specifically, I wonder if there's a role on the last comment of the male leadership to utilize sports figures as the messaging tool to males, because that's not only a powerful medium, but it's obviously something that, especially in India, all guys are watching <laughs> sports of some sort. So is that, a, is that an avenue that's possible? Absolutely. I think any role model, sports, uh, film stars, um, social norms change when they're broad sweep um, role models and interventions. Um, absolutely. Dina, Raj, just some closing words. Well, just I think it's it's not in that case, you know, solely about um, you know how a male treats a woman, but what does it mean to be a man and how is masculinity um, defined overall? Um, and um, I guess maybe just two pleas on like things that I think if you're funding in this space, I'd love to see. Um, we'd love to have more partners in. I mean, one is. Uh, already married girls. So we talk a lot about delaying child marriage and that was very much me for a couple of years and on my most recent trip to India um, just had a chance to meet a, an incredible mom who was doing amazing things for her daughter um, who was dressed very modernly and was very proud of the fact that she was going to secondary school and we had this incredible exchange. I was so impressed with this woman and and as I left there I realized there was a young woman sitting in the corner fully veiled. Um, this is a very conservative um, community in Rajasthan. And and I said, oh, and, you know, who is this? Well, this is my daughter-in-law. Um, and so just that need to look at already married girls, so important. Um, and, and certainly the work with boys and men and, and definitely the need to talk about sex and sexuality for girls as well. Raj, 15 oh. seconds. <laughs> no, I think as somebody mentioned that, you know, it's a hugely economic decision, right? most of the time. So more and more efforts which can be done can be highlighted in terms of untraditional, non-traditional roles which women can take up. And you know, Cynthia is here. They're holding a workshop on untraditional roles for the girls and other things too. That will help because at the end of the day, male is looking from the economic, uh, this point of view. And as much as we are able to address that, that would be very helpful. Maybe turn marry me later into maybe not married at all or married when and if I choose. <laughs> when yes. And if I choose. Great. Well, on that note, thank you very much for being such lovely panelists and thank you guys.